thanks for coming. Uh, it's good to see, good to see everybody. Uh, some new faces, some old faces, some long-time community faces. I won't, I won't point, the, point those out because nobody likes to feel as old as I do. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you. I really appreciate uh, all the effort of uh, the Drupal Camp New Jersey uh, team. It's all volunteer run, and without them, we wouldn't be here uh, having fun. So maybe we can just give them a quick round of applause for all the work they do. Thank you. Uh, and uh, this talk is going to be uh, somewhat technical, but high level, like technical sort of architecture kinds of things, and not. There's no Gatsby in this talk, so if you're looking for that, I'm sure there's other more talented people talking about that. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Lullabot. Uh, we design and build really big Drupal sites. That's what we love to do, a lot of uh, re-platforms and migrations and stuff. Uh, I've been in the Drupal community uh, for quite a while, 15 plus years. That explains all the white hair or lack of hair. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's, I'll, I'll share some stories from the, back in the Drupal days uh, as well, the, the old days <laughs> of yore. Uh, we have a couple uh, other sister companies uh, within our group. We uh, have Tugboat. It's a uh, deployment previews as a service. So if you're looking to build out pull requests and have uh, on-demand environments that people can see and click around on, uh, that's what that does. And then we have Drupalize Me. How many people are familiar with Drupalize Me? Yeah. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that's sort of our portfolio that we have. Uh, I'm in Rhode Island, so I, I actually flew in this morning, uh, and uh, I have to fly out pretty quick, mostly because we've been, uh, uh, the Lullabot team and, and I have been uh, traveling quite a bit, so <laughs> maybe next time I can stay a little bit longer, but I'm a little tired, a little uh, road weary. Um, all right, this, this next, the last one seems a bit selfish to put on there, uh, but the, uh, the, the reason I put it on there uh, for, for being the best CEO is that the award was granted solely from uh, employees, re employee reviews, so I leave it here more to recognize my team for their, for their efforts, because uh, I think to be the best CEO, you probably wouldn't want this on your, uh, probably wouldn't be talking about it, <laughs> but they are the reason I strive to be my best, and I'm greatly honored to be working with them. If you've got a website, Sorry. you need a system to manage your That's a little too much rock and roll. If you want to build a web application, you got to download Drupal. Drupal, 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 Drupal. If you've got a website, you need a system to manage your content. That was way back in the days. My, my uh, uh, co-founder, Jeff Robbins, uh, is also uh, a real life rock star. And of course, when he became a part of the, hi Neil, it's really good to see you, man. Um, <laughs> when he became a part of the uh, Drupal community, the first thing he thought is, uh, well, you gotta have a jingle. Uh, so he put that together. Um, my talk does feel a little bit like a cheesy soap opera at times. Uh, it's divided into three sections. The first part sort of sharing how uh, I became uh, connected with the Drupal community. The second part sort of talks about my own season of dis disillusionment and burnout. And then the last part is sort of uh, coming back again and sort of uh, um, realizing that it's uh, my community too and I want to participate. So uh, let's go ahead and dive in. There's, uh, I like to pull out values from stories, values and narratives, and so as I was putting this together, I kind of saw the ones that stood out to me, and I just wanted to, to sort of bring those uh, front and center. I think it's good to know the values. They go a long way to understanding why I'm here with you. They may even help understand like why we're here together. Uh, there's a value behind every story and a reaction we, we make, uh, and I try to call them out when I see them. Uh, uh, I don't usually like to swear in presentations, so if you'll give me some grace on the, on the last one. My wife is originally from Spain, and uh, she's less familiar with uh, North American idioms uh, as a result. And one time we were going on a date many, many years ago, and I just looked at her and I said, man, I've been working my ass off 
And she just sort of looked at me and she thought, you know, that's, that's strange. I don't know what a donkey has to do with his work, but okay, we'll just go with it, you know. And she didn't say that out loud. That was just sort of her thought process. And so she likes to kind of repeat things too. So she gets comfortable with it, can use it next time. You know, and a week goes by and then she comes, she comes downstairs and I'm in the kitchen making dinner and she goes, man, I've been working my ass. <laughs> yeah, it's a donkey. Um, so this is my story about Drupal. I hope to hear your story as well. They're an essential part of maintaining the fabric of our culture. Uh, we're just we're we're more than source code. So with all those uh, all that out of the way, let's jump in. This is my first internet. This is the maybe circa 1982 World Book Encyclopedia set. My dad uh, loved the door-to-door -door salesman, and when uh, th this particular salesman came by, he uh, knew that this was for me and the future of my education. Does anybody remember these by chance? I mean, <laughs> wow, it's incredible. You can get them on eBay for like $400. Um, I don't know why you would do that. Uh, they actually had a subscription model uh, to them, if you remember. Every year, you would get uh, the year in review, and I would love uh, reading that book and devour all the pithy knowledge that it contained. Uh, and yeah, I was the kid that read uh, encyclopedias for fun. Um, I was also the kid that like quit high school, so <laughs> don't get your hopes up yet. Um, but one day, uh, my dad came home with a computer, uh, and canceled the encyclopedia subscription. Uh, it was running the latest, greatest operating system, Windows 95. More importantly though, it had a 56K modem and I was ready to dial up and dive in and learn. Uh, this was the first site that I visited. Uh, wish you may remember. I couldn't wait to come home from school and wait for the internet pages to load. Uh, that screeching white noise hiss of the modem connecting was the sound of freedom to me. Or if you were my parents, it was the sound of not being able to use the phone the rest of the evening. You see, the internet I grew up with was goofy and relatively safe. It was full of really cheesy clip art, uh, clip art like under construction icons for your Sisyphusian website that was never ever done. Uh, and web developers could change cursor icons and cursor tails. We even had marquee uh, HTML tags to make the text move around on the screen. <laughs> so then one day, uh, I asked a question that changed my life forever. My father worked as a diesel mechanic, and he didn't know the answer to this question either. He suggested I turn my search to Yahoo, so I did. And with some searching and some learning and some reading, I did a simple right click of the home page of yahoo.com. I selected view source from the dialog menu and fell deep into the matrix of the internet. How many people remember the first time they, had, they did a right click of a web page and saw the source code? Yeah, it's a pretty big moment. Um, here's what it looks like when you get there. This is actually Yahoo's source code. You have to understand, I had never seen computer code before. I wasn't studying computers. My first thought was, oh my god, my dad's going to kill me for breaking the computer. I didn't even know how to get out of this. My second thought was like, whoa, this is really cool. This is like the, that 90s movie, movie, Hackers. And then I thought, oh no, now Yahoo's going to sue me for, break, for hacking their website. <laughs> thought I'd done something really bad. Anyway, somewhere between all of this obfuscation and spacer gifts, I began, began to understand but this was just client-side output of the Yahoo homepage. I didn't break the computer, I didn't hack the servers, but man, I really wanted to understand what was happening with all this code. So with a little more research, I found Joe Barda's website. Does anybody remember this website? One person. I've given this talk a couple times and nobody's raised their hand, that's awesome. So this guy, uh, was teaching how to build websites for free. His gift actually started my web development career. What's funny about this is this web page, uh, I didn't go to archive.org. It's exactly the same today as it was 20 years ago. Uh, to those who say table-based layouts are dead, I give you exhibit A. Accessibility aside for a moment, there is a frugal-esque beauty to seeing old code still do the job it was set out to do. 
So I read Joe's website completely front to back. I guess there isn't really a front to back on the internet, up and down all the way through. Uh, and I decided to start teaching HTML classes at my local libraries for free. I taught people with all ages, all experiences. Some days I taught HTML. Other days, I taught people that when they reach the end of the mouse pad with their mouse, they can just pick it up, go back over, and start again. And that was okay, because my religious zeal for the internet was strong, and I knew that if my students just stuck with it, there was a land of infinite possibility on the other side. And in the year 2000, something else happened in addition to the big Y2K scare. Does any remember, anybody remember when this happened? When all of the open source uh, suites came out on Windows. It was a pretty big deal. So uh, when this happened, uh, it brought open source into my world, or more succinctly, my parents' basement. Uh, I was just a kid, didn't have money for Microsoft Access or any of those other things. I also uh, didn't have access to a Linux machine, or let alone how to pronounce it. So I downloaded and installed the packages, and then ran upstairs shouting to my parents, a server, a server, I downloaded a server, which of course made my dad really nervous. What's a server, he asked. He said, I, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure we need one. <laughs> Eventually, it was time to head to college and start a web design company. No cameras for this slide. Uh, let's not dwell on this for too long. The more you look at it, the more my reputation will fade. Uh, while at Iowa State University, I did like any proactive animal ecology major would do and built my own CMS for my internet business. It was the era when Internet Explorer just came out with WYSIWYG functionality, and I wrapped a database-driven CMS around that. I received a small amount of work. As time went on, though, I was a developer of one, and of course spending more time fixing bugs than adding new features. I knew of open source, but I didn't know how to do open source, uh, and I was getting tired of maintaining my own platform. So I went back to my good friend Yahoo and started to look around. Yahoo took me here. This is about the 2002 era for Drupal. Does anybody remember Drupal.org looking like this? A couple of people. There was so much that I didn't understand about this site. Drupal. That blue face does not look like he wants to be friends with me. Community plumbing? Oh dear, I don't think of good things when I think of a community plumbing system. I certainly don't think about content management. So I closed my browser and, went and kept looking. Uh, after, exhaust after exhausting all the other options, I came back because in fairness to Drupal, I didn't even look at the source code. And the more I read about the node architecture, the more I wanted to check it out. I downloaded the source code and found this. I don't even know if this code is still, still in there. Um, but as a non-computer programmer, this code took me to the, a level deeper into the matrix. For the sake of brevity, I don't show it here, but this was the first project where I actually found detailed comments combined with elegant architecture. The Drupal community had essentially made a modular architecture leveraging PHP's ability for a variable to become a function call if the variable name is followed by a set of parentheses. You can see that here, right? Um, clearly, these are smart people. And I printed out Drupal's source code on my inefficient inkjet printer and began reading. I'm serious. Back then, though, it was only 20, 20 or so pages, so don't do it now. You'll kill a whole forest. Uh, this was the moment I fell in love with Drupal, the code. You know that feeling you get when you read a poem, how it transports you to another time and place beyond the limitations of prose, uh, where words start to dance like images against the backdrop of your mind? That's what happened when I read Drupal's source code. It was everything I had wanted to be in a programmer. I knew I could learn from the community. Maybe if I understood enough, I could even participate. So, in 2003, I started contributing to Drupal. It was really only 30 or so people emailing CVS patches back and forth to each other at the time. We used IRC and coated by the light of our torches, wiping the cheese dust of Doritos away from our loincloths before the light of a new dawn. A personal highlight for me was writing and becoming the maintainer of Path Module. Uh, in Drupal core in the 4.5 release. This slide is the maintainer's text file that ships with Drupal, that shipped with Drupal at that time. 
Uh, I got to add my name to it, and I felt really proud and recognized by the community. Meanwhile, at university, I showed my animal ecology friends, Drupal, and how amazing it was, and realized that by the reaction, I should probably do, be doing something else with my uh, college time. So just about I, as I was a fi just as I was about to finish my uh, college degree, uh, I met this guy. This is my mentor. His name is John Van Dyke. Actually, his name is Dr. John Van Dyke. He is this is a mouthful an adjunct assistant professor and senior systems analyst at Iowa State University within the entomology department. Let that sink in for a moment. He's a computer geek who fixes computer bugs for the advancement of real bugs. <laughs> Truly, John is on a chosen path. So I met John when, I was, uh, when, I, when he posted a job looking for a developer with open source experience. John took all my passions for technology, uh, amplified them, uh, like any good mentor would do. John's accomplishments are many, but I'll name just a few. So he decided that we should write a book together about Drupal, um, because there just wasn't one yet. Uh, uh, the book was titled Pro Drupal Development. Many developers credit that book as their safe entry point into understanding the inner workings of Drupal. How many people remember this book? <laughs> That's awesome. I don't feel as old now. Um, <laughs> making me feel young. So um, John, along with Dries, maybe you don't know this, uh, made the first ever Drupal conference happen back in 2005. Neil, were you at that conference? The, the yeah. one in, yeah, I, thought, I think you were. Um, so his, reason, his reasoning for wanting to do a conference was simple. Hey, we've been doing this Drupal thing for a while, and we've never met. We should meet. Um, now, one thing to understand about me at the time, I had never been on an airplane before. Next thing you know, I'm flying to Belgium with John, uh, and if John really wants to get back at me for putting this photo up in front of people, he'll tell you how I, how I ended up getting lost in the stairwells of our Antwerp hotel. In my defense, who had ever heard of a floor zero? It made no sense. After I found my way out, it made a lot of sense. Um, but I, uh, uh, the, the uh, conference that we had, there was a, I remember there was 30 of us, and we had name tags but uh, we did in big letters our IRC handles, uh, and then we did in tiny letters our real names, <laughs> because that's how we knew each other. Um, John was also instrumental in the underpinnings of Drupal's content construction kit and the metadata-driven approach to Drupal's node architecture. Later on, this becomes fields and core. He also authored actions and workflow modules and many other kinds of things. I'm just really thankful that I had him uh, as a mentor in my life and, and helped me write better code. But it was clear that Dru Drupal was blossoming at this point, and I had an opportunity to start a new company. So I met my, my uh, co-founder, Jeff Robbins, in 2005. I met him within the Drupal community, and we decided to start Lullaby and keep telling the world about Drupal and hire all the talented friends we had in the community. We were motivated by evangelism and education. There were so many reasons why Lullabot wouldn't work. Uh, Drupal wasn't being used on big websites. Most people hadn't heard of Drupal, and it made zero sense for me to walk away from an amazing salaried university job that I had just received. Does anybody know the 10-10 rule for decision making? You take a you take a decision, you think about it, you think about the, how you will feel 10 days out, 10 weeks out, and then 10 months out, sort of stretch the time and see what the answer is. Um, that this is one of the times that I had to sort of think on that scale. And what it came down to for me is I knew if I'd regret this decision if I didn't try. So we went for it. That's the first part. So we were having the time of our lives. Uh, we were sharing Drupal with the world, and we were building, building some really big Drupal websites. However, I ran into a season of disillusionment about a year after Lullaby started. It took a while for Acquia to win the trust of and foster a healthy relationship with the community. When you grow that fast, with that much scale, and that much money, there's likely to be collateral damage along the way. The announcement of Acquia was a surprise to everyone, including Dries. You see, a reporter had learned that Dries was forming a Drupal company and was going to publish an article before Dries had a chance to announce it himself. Dries rushed to publish and inform everyone before the article came out. This all happened in a ridiculous time frame of a couple of hours. I can't even 
imagine the stress level this created for Dries. This is the email that he sent out, like, I've only got an hour left, there's a company happening, you gotta trust me, let's catch up later. Um, and, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, so up until the announcement of Dries' new company, Drupal was pretty much a cottage industry. And on one hand, what incredible commitment Dries had to Drupal to launch a business to support it. That was reassuring. But many of us within the community needed some time to adjust to what felt like the first commercial factory on Drupal Island. It was big, scary, and unknown. Will Aquia make a closed sourced version of Drupal? Will there be any work left for us? Will it still be fun to work on Drupal when Drupal was a larger commercial interest? Now listen, I'm, res I'm responsible for spreading my own fear, uncertainty, and doubt about Aquia. And I'm sorry I did that. The truth was, uh, I was reactive and scared, and I didn't want anything to change. In hindsight, I could have been a better uh, beacon of support within the community during this time. And undeservedly, it was also the community that helped me get through this, uh, my own fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Any healthy ecosystem needs a sustainable model, and Dries felt like this was the best future for Drupal. The truth is, it was probably the best possible outcome. If Dries didn't fill this space of creating a utility type company for the platform, it would have been filled by a much larger entity that would most likely be much less interested in our community. The passage of time provides the greatest insights of all. And the good news is that we, the community, and Acquia have learned to coexist and strive to peacefully coexist together. It's easy for economic interests to collide with community values. The voice, which is usually in the middle creating chaos, is greed. We're all susceptible to it. I believe a primary way to keep greed at bay is for companies to continue to create and distribute opportunity within our ecosystem. This can be done by letting your team contribute back to Drupal, collaborating openly, and recognizing others for their efforts. Or as Tim O'Reilly says, way more elegantly than I do, give more value than you take. I'll share more of my lessons from this experience in the third part of my talk. Did anybody know about this, the announcement, and how it all happened? A couple people, yeah. <clears throat> so this is what I started connecting to when I joined uh, Drupal, is I saw all the opportunity that it created, uh, and um, I saw all the opportunity that it created, and Drupal changed my life. Um, it gave me access to doing things and going places that otherwise weren't available to me. Uh, along with this incredible opportunity came the classic superhero complex of needing Drupal to save the world. Um, because if it works for me, it can work for anyone else. Uh, but what if it doesn't save the world? Have you ever been that passionate about a project or a cause so much that you give all of you and more to the cause? It's not an uncommon feeling. Actually, there's been plenty of studies about it. Uh, however, it's likely to become an unhealthy, it's, it's likely to become an unhealthy commitment. And since a large part of Drupal was fueled by community contributions, uh, you know, people weren't getting paid, it wasn't jobs, we were just doing uh, volunteer stuff to begin with, it was really easy to get burned out. Passion can drive us to go above and beyond, or worse, community pressure can push us beyond our levels of self-care. I essentially felt like I gave my life to Drupal, and Drupal became my life. It wasn't bad, but it became all I had, and other parts of my life began to disappear. My relationships, my friends outside of Drupal, and more. A therapist once told me, you vote with your feet. The idea is that where you are physically and mentally reflects what is most important to you. In other words, it's not what you say, it's what you do that counts. And I wasn't paying attention to the things that I was voting against when I was giving everything to Drupal. And to be clear, I don't blame Drupal for any of this. This is a, my, own, my own doing. So 30% of Drupal's lifespan was spent building Drupal 8. It took five years to release, which speaks to the magnitude of change that Drupal 8 brought. One thing was clear. Uh, Drupal was growing and responding to the business needs of its new enterprise constituents. It's good for business, obviously, but it also made it harder for the hobbyists to justify using Drupal for their one-off site. 
And this shift towards what felt like needing a computer science degree in order to contribute to Drupal 8 brought about some resentment and alienation within the community. Does anybody feel this or no? Sometimes I wonder if I'm the only one that, yeah, some. Uh, and yet others had much less problem shifting towards Drupal becoming a more object-oriented framework and were able to adapt with Drupal. In short, Drupal's place had become large-scale digital experiences, and it was isolating to some of us that had grown up with a different version of Drupal. It felt like the honey honeymoon phase was over and that Drupal was the everything that, that the Drupal that was the everything to everyone had grown up found its, and found its career competing on the large scale CMS market. <clears throat> so take an old PHP project like Drupal and compare it against a modern JavaScript web app. Which one feels more responsive and delightful, delightful to use? The last eight years has seen the advancement of JavaScript and microservices architectures, and many people feel like this poses a serious threat to Drupal and other monolithic CMS platforms. That JavaScript has set the new bar for the level of responsiveness and experience a modern web app should have. Not to mention, JavaScript is incredibly portable across platforms, including your browser and your web server. It makes it difficult to justify someone choosing to learn PHP in today's software development workflow, it workforce. Um, what will our users think if we give them Drupal when the rest of the web is offering a sleeker experience? Are we betting on the wrong horse? We're going to look at this a little bit more in my next, my next section. <laughs> this slide is a bit unsettling. It's supposed to be like a peaceful, harmonious monastery, but it looks like that woman is about to get a really big injection from a monk. <laughs> As you can tell, there was a lot going on. I was burned out and worried about the future of Drupal. It had taken a toll on my relationships, and I lost focus and lost track of what was really important to me. So I got away for a bit, literally sold all my stuff Went to Salvation Army, bought a fork, a spoon, a plate, and a, and a, a pan to cook some food in, uh, and hung out at a Zen monastery for a while, as you do. This isn't the one that I went to. They didn't have, um, they didn't have needles at my monastery. Um, also, uh, let's see, I did a lot of really interesting things, a lot of introspection and reflection, and a lot of different kinds of exercises while at the Zen Center. I'd love to tell you about them sometime, but I'm just going to share one experience. A particularly powerful moment was learning the practice of something called Tong Len. It comes from more of a, a Tibetan Buddhist tradition. In that practice, you are guided to hold the suffering of the world, all of it, to breathe in the suffering of the world, my family, my friends, the people in my town, my country, my world, and exhale thoughts of loving kindness and compassion, not to heal them, but to relate to them, to join in our humanity, and to simply be human. This exercise was a cogent reminder that the very act of running from my own suffering is the one suffering I'm capable of avoiding one less ounce of suffering in the world to endure. That practice, that Tonglen practice, brought an intimacy to my life that was missing. We're all human beings going through the same overall ups and downs, and it generated compassion and goodwill and a stronger desire to do good in the world. Many wise people have said in various ways that giving to others is the source of greatest contentment and satisfaction. It's no wonder that altruism is a core virtue within many of the world's religions. So my experience at the temple gave me gratitude and left me a big steaming mess of snot and tear and joy for weeks. It's really difficult to describe having your chest blown open with love and then attempt to seamlessly acclimate back into everyday life, but I needed it. And I would love to hear your stories as well uh, sometime. I hope that we get a chance to talk. Remember, Drupal is more than source code. And for many of us, like myself, it's the people that keep us here as well. So Aquia didn't go away, but my attitude changed. The truth is, an entity like Aquia ended up increasing opportunity for pretty much everyone. I think they're at like 900 jobs now uh, alone. 
There are more people using Drupal and more people looking for Drupal help. Acquia made it easier for companies to choose Drupal as their company-wide platform. It gave Drupal enterprise-level support, which was sorely missing. In improvisational comedy, there's this rule of yes and. The idea is you take the current improv scene, say yes to it, and then expand on that line of thinking. The opposite approach, no but, really just shuts down communication and ends the scene. The practice of abundance is the improv equivalent of yes and for life. Yes, there are times to be skeptical and scared, but oftentimes, at least in my own head, those voices are loudest when I feel small. And some, when I feel small, and sometimes we need perspective that, hey, we're all floating on this big rock in outer space together, and that most of our everyday hazards in life aren't that big a deal. There's plenty of Drupal to go around. There's plenty of Drupal work as well. Abundance can be a call to action. When I was freaking out about Acquia, I forgot one important piece of information. I realized Drupal is our community too, and I choose to remain a part of it. JavaScript also isn't going anywhere. For people just getting into programming and building websites, I would probably recommend that they start with JavaScript to learn from, and then over, over getting into something like Drupal. Drupal is a platform which fills a very specific need, managing complex content and all the things around it. <clears throat> Curious, show of hands, if someone, if you had a, a young budding programmer come to you, would you, uh, show of hands, they recommend learning PHP to start with? One, Drupal? JavaScript? Yeah. Python. <laughs> Tim, are you being serious? Yeah. Nice. Um, so anyway, it doesn't mean that these technologies can't coexist. I think, again, coming from a place of abundance, there's plenty of room for both. We treat Drupal and JavaScript as rivals, in part because server-side JavaScript can do things that PHP does, but most of the world doesn't think of PHP and JavaScript as opposite of each other. This chart is from Stack, the Stack Overflow Developer Survey. It shows that People who like PHP dislike ASP, not JavaScript. ASP is the rival. And people that like React dislike Angular, not PHP. What's also interesting about this, I was just, where's, do I have lasers? I don't know if I have lasers? If you look at the top here, do you see it? The, the third one from the top? It says that um, back end developers dislike front end developers <laughs> by a lot. And then, go all the way to the bottom where front-end front developers are like, I don't know, back-end developers are okay. <laughs> this chart from Stack Overflow shows how polarizing different technologies are in the ecosystem. Look at how closely JavaScript and PHP are together, signifying a relationship. Incidentally, it looks like Drupal, which is here, uh, is more polarizing than PHP or JavaScript, which makes sense because Drupal's complicated. Python, Java, .NET, and others are all languages that tend to be thought of as their own islands. In other words, it would be more common to compare PHP to these languages instead. And this lovely chart shows how much engineers dislike a particular language. God bless Perl. <laughs> PHP isn't a bed of roses, but at least Perl absorbs our collective incoming disdain, and as such becomes a martyr language for the rest of us. You have to give Perl a little respect for that. PHP, I think, is a much better language these days than a lot of people give it credit for. Uh, with a lot of good high-level language features, performance, and tooling. There's a website over there on the side, phptherightway.com, and it's a great guide for best practices when it comes to that language. But on a whole, we still like JavaScript more than we like PHP. I guess it depends on your affinity for dollar signs and semicolons. <laughs> I, um, What's interesting, uh, it, maybe we should just rewrite the whole thing in R, which tends to be the most liked language according to Stack Overflow. 
Um, the, I guess the irony in all of this Drupal and JavaScript contention is that you may not even need PHP to leverage Drupal. You get a lot out of the box with a Drupal core and a handful of the modules like the JSON API. Um, and there's a lot of interesting examples out there that uh, use JavaScript to take advantage of Drupal uh, in decoupled or API-based ways. Um, so it's pretty cool how things have changed. Um, JavaScript is being used to modernize Drupal, and that's really exciting. Uh, you, you guys, prob you all probably know that um, we're hoping to see the full JSON API support uh, with the API First initiative, with uh, the 8.7 release of Drupal, which is how far away? Two months? <laughs> Two and a half months. No pressure. No, I know you're not working on it. Um, so the team that is working on that, uh, that I guess does feel the pressure, and I don't want them to feel too much pressure, uh, is building a React-based admin UI for Drupal. Uh, if you haven't seen it, take a look at Dries's, uh last keynote where he had a, had a video of it. It's pretty awesome. And if you are interested, there is a URL to go check it out. Um, JavaScript is driving Drupal to adapt a modern, fast-to-respond front-end that users expect from a web experience today. It opens up Drupal to a wider audience and allows them to build really cool and different UIs around our CMS and its core strength of managing structured content. Are we behind? Yeah. Will we get there? I believe we will. And you can help, too. <coughs> I don't mean to turn all pro Drupal on this talk. You know, Drupal does have its faults. However, in sincerity, I haven't found an open source CMS that can do as much as Drupal can. I do think other platforms have won out in other non-enterprise tiers. Um, but the truth is Drupal is really good content management system with 18 years of development behind it. With that kind of history, it's why we have over 2,000 supported, stable Drupal 8 contributed modules. Drupal 8 was hard and at times an alienating release, but I do believe that we've made it through an otherwise tough transition. More sites are switching to Drupal 8. And the shift to a predictable release schedule, I think, has done wonders to boost momentum and energy around the project. A five-year release to get Drupal 8 was not a sustainable model. This new approach has given Drupal a heartbeat, which improves the overall project and many of our jobs with steady, dependable work. Drupal doesn't, <coughs> sorry, that was poppy. Drupal doesn't save the world. People do, you do. And Drupal has been used to amplify the voice of hundreds of millions of people. The list of organizations which uses Drupal is, is, is astonishing. I'm not going to go show the list. There's case studies for that. But I am grateful so many of us have sustainable employment or business models that allow us to keep doing the thing we fell in love with so long ago. And for some people today, perhaps, that passion isn't as deep, and that's okay too. The fact remains many of us are getting paid to work in open source, and that's pretty awesome and an incredible feeling which harkens back to my personal reasons for falling in love with Drupal to begin with, all the way back to good old Joe Barta teaching me how to build a website. Remember at the beginning of the talk when I showed you that maintainer's text file uh, from Drupal with my name at the bottom on it? It took me a while to really understand the full impact of what had happened. It wasn't until I navigated to uh, a subdomain of yahoo.com, typed in the URL to that maintainer's text file, and saw my name on a subdomain of yahoo.com. Same for Amnesty International and other sites. That's when it hit me, the impact my journey has had. Every contribution you make in Drupal enables someone else to go further and accomplish more. Just like it did for you when you first started using Drupal, we build upon the success of others. And that changes people's lives. That's a cause I can get behind. Just one last word of caution regarding having a cause. I burned out hard. I wish someone would have told me that I mattered more than the cause. Truthfully, they probably did, and I was probably too stubborn to listen. Burnout, especially in communities with large volunteerism components, is nearly predictable. It's easy to give everything to a cause because you believe in the cause. It gives us passion and purpose and direction. And if you leave, 
it feels like you're not just leaving the community, it feels like you're leaving the cause too. And your community will not accept that you're giving up on the cause, even if it's not the reason for leaving. In Drupal, we have that saying, come for the code and stay for the community. It really captures the spirit and intent we want to have, which is to be welcoming and to be open and realize that Drupal is people too. But as safe it is, as it is to join, we need people to know it's also safe to leave. Cause-driven burnout is predictable. You see in activism, politics, religious groups, school groups, I've watched my friends, my employees, and to a lesser degree myself go through this burnout. Don't participate in something out of obligation. You are not consumable fuel. Don't glorify death marches, no, fut no futons, kitchens, and all-nighters. It's usually just covering up bad planning, understaffing, poor resourcing, and terrible expectation setting. A heroic effort is usually evidence of a flawed process. Don't punish boundaries when people exercise them. We all have a right to self-care and to step away. This is a famous quote from the TV show The Wire. But I think it's what happens to many of us when we get caught up in the pursuit of our lives. Sometimes we keep our goals and causes so far out of reach that we spend our lives chasing things we can never actually grab hold of, like my pursuit of needing Drupal to save the world. And yet every day, in every moment, we are living and making small decisions that form who we are. But we don't really pay attention to them because we're chasing bigger things. Has anybody heard of the mountains and valleys exercise before? Uh, one person, Adam in the back, it's, it's a short exercise. The gist is that you tell a friend stories about your greatest moments in life, the things that if someone was to write your biography, the stories that you'd want to share. The other person listens not just not to the story, but to the values that were present in those, in those moments. Uh, that, that gave you the reason for feeling that way. Uh, so like, I don't know, resilience or courage or things like that. You get a list of 10 to 20 of those things and then you go through it together and say, what are the five that you can't live without? And my point for telling you that uh, is uh, who you are isn't about who you want to be in the future. It's not about waiting for the moments that never come. Life is about the decisions you're making now and have made every single day to get you to here. Stop waiting for the moments that never come. Time swiftly passes by and opportunity is lost. And at the risk of getting cheesy and going full telenovela, I'll say this one thing. Fall in love with who you are now, which as it turns out is a necessity for falling in love with anything or anyone else. Self-care is the one job nobody else can do for you. Got just two more slides. Being a member of the Drupal community means you're here because you belong. It's a place to flourish, grow roots, and have members care about what happens to you and cheer when you succeed. But only you can set the boundaries you, meet, you need to maintain a healthy relationship. And we are also interested in what you bring to the Drupal community beyond your code contributions. Do more than Drupal because you are so much more than Drupal. In fact, if you think about it, you change the world just by being here at this camp. That's what open source is really all about. I fell in, I fell in love with Drupal again because I believe in the people, the community, and those relationships have paid dividends on personal and professional levels. I find solace in that Drupal may change and new technologies may arise, but these relationships will likely last forever. And if you surround yourself with amazing people, it's the best kind of way to stay in front of the future as other tools uh, come, in, come in and out of the limelight. There is a strength, a focus, a drive that comes from fully embracing a choice. And I'm really proud to be a part of the community with you and the tools that we make for the world together. I'll leave this slide for you to read as my closing thoughts. But thank you. We've got time for a couple couple questions, I think. Four minutes. So now yeah. you have this uh, Drupal, I assume it's a monolithic technology, but in microservices world, what, what do you think? Because it worked so long. In the no microservices world? Yeah. How it will be playing out? I think. Uh, the question for the yeah, there's a. Uh, good job, Benji. 
there's a there's, so there, Drupal is historically a monolithic CMS. How do you see the microservices stuff coming into play? Um, my default answer is like I don't know. I'm just a business guy now. Like I don't I don't develop anymore. My other answer is I know there's a lot of people here thinking about it and, and talking about it. I know there's a lot of work. I think Adam was talking about you know using Gatsby on the front end of Drupal and all that sort of stuff. I think the microservices stuff there. I think for Drupal, I think again if you look at Drupal as the uh, content uh, management content repository, I think there's a place where Drupal can sit on the back end, never be exposed to the front end, and you have all kinds of other services and microservices com consuming that content because the model, the content modeling is a really elegant component in Drupal. It just all depends on what you're trying to do and how many services need to access that, that content store. Got it. Yeah, well, question in the back there. So uh, there's a technical question of like, what's the 10 year future of Drupal and we are pushing to decouple, you know, like as this Drupal, we're agreeing on that. I, I would like your insight on what, what do you see the 10 year future for the Drupal community and the ecosystem, like not the technology, the community, the ecosystem, the marketplaces, the companies, how they're interacting with DA, like all these parts, what's the, what's the future of those things? How are they going to shift around? Because Aqua came in and shift, you know, like it shifts. Even Acquia's business has shifted. The example is they're going to more services, like offering personal CRM services. Um, yeah, what's the future? Like, do you have some personal vision of the 10-year vision of Drupal? I, I mean, not where it might go, how, yeah. how it's gonna change. Yeah, the question is, is uh, what's, the, what's the vision for the, uh, for the for the next 10 years of the Drupal community, or where the Drupal community will be at in the next 10 years. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I have the bravado to even pull that off. I, um, you know, I, I think I think the thing that will most influence that answer is, uh, you know, we've we the community has listed its values uh, out there for the world to see. You know, we need to maintain accountability uh, of those values and continue to include and bring people in. I think there are threats to the community, particularly around new people wanting to learn Drupal. Uh, that's a very daunting effort, uh, and that's one that I worry about uh, a lot, is, is that can erode our community quickly. Um, you know, in terms of the, the business side, I don't know. I think you'll see your standard sort of commodification life cycle over time where you'll see other businesses consume other businesses through acquisitions and mergers and things like that. Um, but I think as long as I'm, I think the canary in the coal, coal mine, if you will, is the, um, the, uh, the seed of the open source community, like the part of the community that is, that is there for the sake of Drupal um, and you know trying to think about the longevity of Drupal and if they can if they can strive to do that in um, I want to say an unencumbered way but like oftentimes uh, you know big business influences come in and influence the direction of Drupal and we need to be mindful that we don't just have business interests at play we have a long-term interest for Drupal the community and and Drupal the software as a standalone thing too. Um, so I answered your question very indirectly, but those are the things I worry about. No, that's, that's a great answer. I, I, it's a broad question. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Thank you so much, everybody. I hope it was valuable.